Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, this fall it will be nine years that I have been in the ministry. And over those nine years, I have had the privilege and the honor of participating in, leading, and witnessing many, many baptisms, several of them right here in our sanctuary. But as I think back over those past nine plus years, there really is two baptisms that stick out for me in my mind. The first was that of my own son, Dietrich. Trish and I were at seminary, and we were attending St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Union, Missouri. This was back in September, October of 2005. Dietrich was only a month old, and yet it is a day that I will forever remember. I can't look. Stop it. <laughs> anyway, as I remember, Trish and I, we had Dietrich, and when the time of the service came, we took him to the front, surrounded by the baptismal sponsors, and there, just as we do in every baptism, we renounce the devil and his works and all his ways. We pronounced our faith through the Apostles' Creed. Our baptismal sponsors, J.P. and Amy Sema, they agreed that if anything should happen to Trish and I, they would make sure that Dietrich was raised in the Christian faith. And then when the time came, as the proud father and seminarian student, I held my son over the baptismal font. And there, Pastor Robert Creedy cupped the water with his bare hands, poured it over Dietrich's head three times, and said, Dietrich Brian Kletke, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was a picture-perfect day. And I made sure of that, going clear down to the white baptismal gown that his grandmother had made, and the Christ candle that symbolized the light of Christ in his heart. It wasn't much longer, and there was another baptism that I got to witness. And it was that of my niece, Bethany. Many of you know Bethany. She went through confirmation here, often played trumpet for our Easter services before she went off to college last fall. And her baptism was no less beautiful but it couldn't have been more different. You see, Beth, Bethany, instead of being just a one-month-old infant, she was already a young lady of nine years old. And instead of being baptized in a beautiful sanctuary like ours or St. Paul's, she was baptized about a mile away from here underneath some shade trees in the Arkansas River. I remember the day about 25 or 30 of us had gathered on the banks of the river underneath a few trees. We started out by singing a few songs. Her grandfather was a pastor and led us in a short five-minute sermon about the nature of baptism. Bethany publicly professed her belief in Jesus Christ. And after that, Bethany in a pair of shorts, her grandfather in a pair of Cabela's waders, they went out into the river, and in one fell swoop, he tipped her backwards clear under the water and said, Bethany Dale Lyons, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He brought her up out of the water quickly, and then the two of them, completely drenched and shivering, came out of the Arkansas, grinning from ear to ear. Well, it was about two and a half weeks later that my sister Rachel and I were sitting around over the breakfast table. I think it was up in Denver at my folks' house. And we started talking about our children's baptisms, how they were similar, how they were different. We certainly talked about the different ages, the different settings, the different symbols that surrounded the rites. But it really didn't take long until we got to the very heart 
of the question of the sacrament. And Rachel had asked me, why did you take Dietrich to baptism when he was so young and had no idea what was going on? And I in turn asked my sister, why did you wait for Bethany knowing how much grace and mercy is filled in the sacrament? And as we went back and forth, eventually she asked me, point blank, well, what is it you think really happens in baptism? Well, as I stewed on it, I came up with three possible answers. The first possible answer is that nothing really happens in baptism. That baptism is a purely symbolic gesture, a symbol of something that has happened in the heart of the person being baptized. Or perhaps in the case of Trisha and I, our desire that something would happen in the heart of Dietrich. And I've got to admit, that makes some sense. I mean, if I think back to Dietrich's baptism, that whole rite was surrounded with symbolism. From the white robe that he wore to the candle that showed the light of Christ, symbolism was weaved in and throughout that whole service. And I've got to admit that the truth is nothing really happened to Dietrich. I mean, I tell you that it was a picture-perfect day. There was one problem, just one, and it was small. Dietrich cried throughout the whole service. <laughs> as I held him up there, as we professed our faith, as we went through the rite, Dietrich cried through all of it. When Pastor Creedy sprinkled the water on his head, he cried even louder. There was no magical white light. There was no halo that popped into place. Dietrich's behavior didn't change. In fact, if I remember accurately, he didn't stop crying till I handed him back to his mother. <laughs> there was no obvious change to Dietrich. And yet, if you read through the scriptures, you eventually come to realize that the scriptures make it crystal clear that something very special is happening in baptism. You know, I think back to John chapter 3, that conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. And as they start out that conversation, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, we know that Jesus isn't hung up on empty rites. He has railed against the Pharisees for walking through the motions of the law, but their hearts are far away from God. And yet Jesus comes back and he is so certain, so sure, that he says, Unless you are born of water and the Spirit, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Jesus places a very high priority on baptism. Well, there's no denying that there are aspects of baptism that are symbolic. And we play up those aspects which makes the sacred rite beautiful and intriguing. But baptism is not just symbolic. It has to be so much more. Well, the second thing I thought about was perhaps something is actually happening in baptism. Perhaps in baptism we are professing and declaring our desire to follow Jesus Christ. And I've got to admit, that makes a lot of sense too. In fact, there are millions of Christians throughout the world today who believe that is the very nature of baptism itself. It is our public declaration of following Jesus Christ. 
And there seems to be lots of examples of this in Scripture. You think of Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. As Philip sits down and they discuss the Scriptures and Philip shows the eunuch how Jesus is the fulfillment of all those Isaiah prophecies, the eunuch virtually jumps out of the chariot and dives into a pool of water saying, who's to stop me from being baptized? You think to the day of Pentecost, which we will celebrate in just a few weeks. Peter goes through this dynamic sermon, cutting the people to the heart. And then St. Luke in the book of Acts, he says, those who accepted St. Peter's message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 people publicly in the middle of Jerusalem declaring their faith in Jesus Christ. There's a lot to be said for using baptism as a declaration of, of faith. And yet when you get down to the brass tacks, there's something in there that just doesn't quite jive with what we know of the gospel. You think about what St. Paul teaches us in the book of Romans. He says, we believe that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Apart from the law. Well, if Jesus in John chapter 3 tells us that you must be baptized to see the kingdom of God, then what he has done is set up a new law. He may have freed us from the Old Testament commandments and the sacrifices, but then he's instituted a new one where we are no longer saved by grace alone. Now it becomes the grace of Jesus Christ plus my profession of faith. And together I help gain my salvation. But that's not the gospel. The gospel clearly tells us we are saved by grace through faith. And this is not a work of ours. And so I know that there are lots of people who use baptism as a declaration of faith. My niece Bethany did just that. And if I'm entirely honest, Trish and I did the same thing when Dietrich and Dustin and Martha were baptized. We publicly declared that we would raise our children in the Christian church. But baptism is not just a declaration of faith. It has got to be much, much more. Well, if baptism is not just symbolic and it's not just an act of ours, there's really only one thing left. That baptism is, in fact, an act of God. You see, the truth is, you and me and Dietrich and Bethany... We are all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God and we are in need of his forgiveness. And yet, through baptism, God's word and his promises, they come to us, they are bestowed upon us in a life-giving water, rich in grace and mercy, a washing of the new birth in the Holy Spirit. And as you heard me talk with the children earlier today, St. Peter, he makes it crystal clear when he says, baptism now saves you. God acting for your benefit and for mine. Likewise, St. Paul he later goes on and when he's writing to Titus, the young pastor, in the third chapter, he writes these words. God, our Savior, saved us according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal 
of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. At that moment in our baptism, we may recognize that there is a change that has happened in our hearts. We may also take that opportunity to publicly confess our faith in our love for Jesus Christ. But the truth is those are only afterthoughts to what God is doing. Because through water and the word, God washes you of all of your sin. He forgives you. And then he calls you his own and brings you into the family. And so as I was talking with the kids, the truth is, it doesn't matter if you use a few drops of water or if you're baptized in a raging river. It doesn't matter if you use clean water or dirty water. It doesn't matter if you're baptized in a beautiful sanctuary like ours or if you're baptized out underneath some shade trees. Because what truly matters is that through baptism, God acts. And by his grace, you are forgiven. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.